In this week's episode, we will journey to the 17th century and search for one of the purest ways of expressing the nature of the human condition in a portrait painting. Welcome to Learning from Rembrandt. And if you're curious about what brushes or paints, solvents, or any of the mediums that I use, please check the description box of this video. Also, I have paintings available for sale now. I have eight new paintings available for purchase. Now then, we are going to be studying a Rembrandt painting. Please check out Google Arts and Culture for the reference photo used in today's episode. So we're gonna be starting off with our drawing color of choice, which is raw umber. This is again, Williamsburg raw umber. I am using a tiny bit of Gamsol, which is odorless mineral spirits, and a size two Filbert bristle brush, silver brush Grand Prix brand. And we're working on a nine by 12 inch quadruple oil primed, fine textured, excuse me, very fine texture, linen. This is the Classens brand. It is my absolute favorite, favorite brand to use. And it has been toned to a neutral gray value, mid-tone using alkyd oil paints. Now with the painting, we're very simply just blocking in the placement uh, using big shapes, essentially looking for the placement of the head using simple geometric shapes. The idea is to work very loose, very expressive, and most of all, relaxed and confident. Now you're seeing the video is edited so that you can see in real time the way that I create this painting, but there are edits done to the footage so that you can see this in a more streamlined fashion. But the footage is playing in real time. Now the idea here is to get a basic sketch that we can build onto with skin tones. And I'm gonna emphasize the placement of the eyes at the moment here and how it relates to the development of the painting. Now you wanna start off very simply with every shape that you have. Place it down at about say 85% accuracy, which is not terribly accurate, but it's accurate enough to get into the skin tones and you will be building the skin tones around it. So we're using the transparent mummy flake white, a little bit of cadmium green pale, back to transparent mummy, which is pigment PR102, pigment red 102, which is a very, very nice um, oxide red to use to get old master style skin tones. And for a little while, we're going to be talking about, in particular, the placement of the eyes, the orientation of it, and how that relates to the entire structure of the head. What we want is a nice and simple color that we can use to build the painting, just like you've seen in the previous master studies that we've done. As you see, we're starting right around the eyes. I didn't start on the chin or somewhere across the side of the picture. I'm starting around the eyes because it's a way that I can build up to the more complicated stuff. So we're working from simple to complex and we're gonna be working in such a way that whenever we need to make changes, and believe me, we will need to make changes. Those changes are simple and easy to manage. The goal is to study the Rembrandt painting and to interpret visual information and create a master study. Now, this is not intended to be a copy. Remember, we're just under five minutes, and at this point, for the first time I'm telling you in this video, this is not intended to be a photographic copy of the Rembrandt painting. And notice that the photo reference is not in this image either because I want you to be able to look at the footage and be able to follow along with the footage as it is the development of a painting and not a copy of an image. So you can really take in the information. And if you wanna look at the image again, please go to googleartsandculture.com and type in Rembrandt into the search bar and you will find the Rembrandt image that I used for this one. Now notice how everything is kind of centered around the eyes and the nose. 
Now, going back to the idea of placing things, and in particular the eyes, you want to focus on all of the structures surrounding the eyes. Notice we started off with the, the nose, we went to the forehead, the chin, and then we covered the skin tone around the side of the face. This is giving us a platform that we can then build upon. The important thing to focus on here is total relaxation in the sense that you are not stressed, you are not making a whole bunch of marks out of fear, but rather out of confidence. You're placing down your big shapes, your big idea, basically, and you're laying the ground down so that you can build upon it. That's really the secret, if we're going to use that word, in developing the start, a really strong start to a painting. And now we're going to go into a little bit of raw sienna. So a little bit of raw sienna and the flake white and burnt sienna. So we're using both of the burnt siennas. And I'm mixing with a size 4, that is a size 4 bristle brush, uh, extra long filbert silver brush grand prix and i'm using quite a lot of paint and i'm actually going to go for the lightest note now on the forehead so the nice thing about bristle brushes is that they carry a lot of paint and in particular if you're trying to paint a rembrandt study using a lot of paint is usually a good idea and having brushes that allow you to pick up a lot of paint is a great idea and that is use bristle brushes in particular I trust silver brush brand I'm not sponsored by them they're not paying me anything to tell you this um, they're just really good brushes and if you take care of them they tend to last a really long time and if you're using flake white and artist grade oil paints and you're working on a nice surface like a linen oil primed uh, canvas the paint adheres really, really nicely. So you're going to be seeing the paint application seem almost effortless with the materials that we're using today. Now we're mixing up a darker tone, as you're noticing a little bit of the alizarin and crimson went into that, dioxazine purple, black, and we're mixing into the raw umber section, basically the drawing color that we had on the palette before. And we're going to start to put in some darker notes, and we're going for the most obvious stuff in this one. I'm going to be keeping the color relatively low chroma for the first day that I work on this painting. And I'm going to be focusing more or less just in the simple shapes, the big placements, and the drawing value is going to take priority over um, a lot of color. We're going to be focusing more into the drawing. And this is actually how I like to draw. Um, I teach through a, a very uh, systematic way. I introduce my students to a more classical method that involves transfer drawings. Um, and that's a great way to learn. But if you want to explore the more painterly aspects of drawing, Again, try working from simple to complex in the same fashion that you're seeing in the footage here. So again, another video edit there, and you're seeing the accents have been placed for the eyes, the nose, and the mouth. And one thing should be noted that I didn't measure anything at all. And at this point, you can tell that I didn't measure because the mouth is very far down. Now, I'm not telling you to look at the photo reference, but to just look at the painting, because in the painting, you can clearly tell that the mouth is a little bit far down. But that's something that will be changed later on in the painting. Maybe not in the footage, but in the painting, it will be changed. But the important thing, now that we're talking about change, is to introduce, once again, the idea of keeping your shapes simple and easy. You know what I'm going to say, right? So that once... And if at any point any changes need to be done, and of course I will need to make changes, they're simple and easy to manage. So that's the kind of message that I try to give across. Keep your shapes simple and basic. Differentiate light and shadow as much as possible as you're seeing here. And just work with the shapes and interpret the shapes. 
Think about it as a dialogue between basic shapes that eventually leads up to more complex shapes. And we're using that shadow color actually to draw, uh, especially around the outside shape of the face. In fact, we're not even going to touch the background for the majority of the footage. The first day, I actually don't get into the background. I actually save that for the second day because there's going to be a lot of drawing that needs to be done. And I don't always work that way. It's just sometimes I go in full color, background, foreground, middle ground, every, everything. Other times I just draw uh, with very low chroma, and that's what you're going to be seeing today. So we're mixing up black and white, which gives us a cool neutral gray, and I put a little bit of burnt sienna into the neutral gray so it doesn't lean towards the blue. And now what we have is a very nice gray tone that we can just make a little bit cooler with the cerulean blue. But the majority of it is just black and white with a little bit of uh, burnt sienna. And that's going to give us the color for the sclera. And that is the white of the eye. And remember, the white of the eye is not white. And I'm going to talk a little bit more now, again, about the placement of the eyes as you're seeing the footage uh, roll across. The important thing is, again, you can even count on one hand how many shapes I have on the eyes, on each eye. I have maybe no more than five shapes, potentially no more than five brush strokes for each eye. And it is important to stand back, be as far back from the painting as you possibly can so that you can see the basic proportions and not rely too heavily on being too close to the painting and then painting what you think looks correct when in fact is probably needing to be adjusted once you step back another, say, five feet. So now we're going to mix a little bit of the, uh, that is the raw umber. Notice I switched brushes here, raw umber, alizarin crimson, a little bit of black. My brushes are trying to run away from me there. Burnt sienna. And that is a little bit of terra verde, which is a very transparent earth red. Earth green, sorry, it's a very transparent earth green. And what we have is a very simple, uh, relatively quick drying, because it's mainly uh, raw umber, tone that we're going to put for the edge of the hair. And that's just going to help us draw the outside shape of the face. As I said, I'm not going to get too heavy into the background in the first day, but rather just using that to draw around the outside of the face. And at this point, I should reiterate the importance of the neutral gray tone, not just the color of it, but the value. It is fairly dark. It isn't as dark as maybe last week's tone, but it's dark enough that the lights look like lights and the darks look like darks. And in fact, the coolness of the neutral gray tone allows the skin tones to show up a little bit brighter. And we're using that color just to draw out an edge for the, the top of the hairline. But you can see the strategy here. Very simple and basic. Working from the outside shape and just the simple accent marks for the features. And there it is. You have just a little bit of the hair showing through in just mainly raw umber. Now, when I was painting this at the time, I knew that I was going to work on this another day at least. So you can see that the background, there really isn't much done to it except painting in with basically a dry brush. I didn't use any solvent for the background at all to put down the leanest layer that I possibly could for the hair. 
But the neutral gray actually works pretty good for the background for now. And now we're starting to put in more shapes for the mouth. Again, bear in mind that at this point when I was painting, I didn't notice that the mouth was too far down. And now we have more shapes placed in for the side of the nose. And now you're seeing how the painting is starting now to get to a point where we can now go into more values and planes. Now we put in a little bit more of the transparent mummy for the side plane of the nose. Again, that's uh, pigment PR102. It is a very important color, especially if you want to do master studies. It leans a little more towards, I'd say, an earthy red that gives the appearance of an old master painting rather than jumping straight to, say, your cadmiums. And we're still roaming around at the possibly 85% accuracy, maybe moving up to like 86% accuracy, um, so to speak. And we're going to start to build through the midtones. And I'm not telling you this is how Rembrandt painted. We're learning from Rembrandt by observation. We're observing a Rembrandt painting. So you are observing me observing a Rembrandt painting and creating a painting. That's how this works. This doesn't work by me putting the picture there and making you think that I'm copying it. So what I want, again, is for you to observe the act of observation and interpretation in the genesis of a painting that is inspired by a Rembrandt. So as you saw, I'm leaning, again, very heavily on uh, the transparent mummy Rublev color, and I'm using that to add some of the uh, pinkish tones for the lips. But very soon you will see that uh, actually change positioning. And remember, bear in mind that a wooden palette is a very useful because you can change the amount of oiling out that you do to the palette. So when I start painting, I don't oil out the palette at all. I just let the palette be as dry as it can possibly be. And when I develop a painting, say the fourth or the fifth layer later, then I will add a little bit of cold pressed linseed oil to the palette. But that's not the case in a two layer portrait, which is going to be what you're seeing here. So there we have a little more of a pinkish tone for the lips. And we're going to be delineating the side of the nose a little more. As you're seeing, the picture is starting to develop a little bit more through the midtones. And we're going to use the midtones to describe the large planes of the face. And using the large planes of the face, we will put in more accuracy to the painting, but never to the to the level of a, a photocopy machine or anything like that. So all kinds of colors go into that mix, but just think of it as a neutral, neutral gray brownish tone. And again, centered around the eyes. See how I tend to put in as many planes as I can manage around the eyes so that I can uh, sculpt it out, excuse me, I can sculpt it out and literally push as if it was a block of clay the eyes into shape. I can push them into uh, any form that I want. It's malleable. It is such that I'm making any mistakes as obvious as they could possibly be to my eye so I can fix them later down the road. And when you add more values like this in large shapes, the mistakes become more obvious than if I were working with a bunch of uh, little tiny values and rendering one little portion at a time just to, just to see that I have to move something and then spending an hour on an eye and then having to move it would be quite difficult. Not impossible, but difficult.
And there we have our plane for the bottom of the eyelid. Now we're just wrapping that plane around towards the tear duct. And we're putting in a little more pink around the side of the tear duct, leaning towards the more pinkish reds, such as the uh, cadmium red deep. And for my cadmium red deep, I like to use old Holland brand. As you see here, nothing is 100%, and everything is being built in a very simplistic fashion. And the side plane of the nose at this point is almost perfectly rectangular, kind of like a block with an angle for the bulb of the nose that you're seeing um, just now. That brush stroke right there, that's rounding out the bulb of the nose. So you just saw the transition from a blocky type structure to a much more naturalistic with just a few touches of the brush. And now we're putting in the side plane of the orbicularis oris, or the muzzle area of the mouth. And now you've seen the transition where the mouth has actually moved a little bit higher up. And using the same strategy as you saw before, just simple straight lines and angles translating to simple big shapes and big planes enables you to move things with ease. And you're seeing the painting start to develop now from bigger shapes into smaller shapes. But the subdivision of bigger shapes into smaller shapes needs not be entirely mechanical, but it should be somewhat organic when you're just you're just reacting to the paint and sculpting intuitively. And as you may notice, it is very low chroma, and that concludes in day one of the painting process. Notice the painting is facing you straight forward. You will see the angle change when it moves into the next scene, because the camera is at an angle when I'm painting. And there we go. A few days later, the painting is touch dry. It is very much dry enough to continue working. And so what we're gonna do is warm up now. So after letting the painting sit for a couple days, we're going to go ahead and start off with a very simple skin tone using flake white and raw sienna. Raw sienna and burnt sienna. If you recall, I used that same mixture before. Raw sienna, burnt sienna, and lead white. The raw sienna is Old Holland, the flake white is Williamsburg, and a little bit of lead tin yellow went into that mixture. The lead tin yellow is Michael Harding brand. Back to the transparent mummy. Again, the transparent mummy is a Rublev. Back to the transparent mummy. And since flake white is a lead-based white, at this point in the video, we're about maybe halfway through the video, I should speak about flake white. Um, it can be difficult to have access to if you live in a country where you can't use a lead-based white. So if you can only use titanium white, try using titanium white with a tiny bit of yellow ochre into it so that you're... Uh, the white that you use is not too blue because titanium white lean, leans a little bit towards the blue. However, if you want a paint that handles in terms of the consistency, similar to flake white, because flake white has this property of which it allows you to use more of it without raising the value, therefore you have a thicker consistency of paint to get the type of effects like the old masters had, especially with Rembrandt, uh, the Dutch process flake white, today known as stack lead white, uh, the traditional way of creating stack lead white actually leads to um, a flake white with different 
particle sizes in the paint, which can even make an even nicer and thicker paint film than what I'm creating here. Uh, if you want to get a similar effect, you can use the alternatives to flake white. Um, the one I recommend is Gamblin Flake White Replacement. Uh, that one is very close to the handling of my Williamsburg uh, Flake White, but I'm not going to compare it to a more traditional flake white because I haven't really used a stack lead white yet. They're very hard, uh, uh, very difficult to find. And as you're seeing, we've mixed a lot of the flake white, transparent mummy, burnt sienna, lead tin yellow. These are very earthy colors to make a pinkish mid-tone. So this is the second day. And for the second day, we've warmed up by mixing a similar skin tone. And now we're really going to start to go into the uh, refinement of the picture. And now you see the value just went up a little bit. And now we're going to bring it down with the burnt sienna. A little bit of our transparent green, which is terra vert. A whole lot of paint is going into these mixtures. And again, remember, if you use bristle brushes, you can pack on a lot more paint than if you use synthetics. This might be the longest clip where you see me mixing. Back to the same colors, again, the Terra Vert, the Flake White, Burnt Sienna, Transparent Mummy, Lead Tin Yellow. But in, at this point, it's closer to the greenish with more Terra Vert. A lot of Terra Vert. You can see how transparent it is. And there he goes. I'm still adding more paint to this mixture. And there he goes. I'm still adding more paint. So what I'm doing is I'm creating a very, very thick mixture of color. And believe it or not, I add the paint very thinly. What you're seeing off camera there is a uh, dark reddish color that is just a combination of the old colors that I had and all that time spent mixing for this halftone. That had to be a record. Uh, it, it took a very long time to get that mixture. And I'm telling you, this is in real time, so you can really see the uh, true pace at which I paint, which is not that fast. And we're going in with the greenish tones now. Uh, cadmium green pale, that is a Winsor Newton color, mixed in with the burnt sienna. It's almost the same color as the palette. Now you're, sp you're gonna see a lot of clips with these mixtures. I'm going to emphasize uh, these mixtures. And again, I'm gonna emphasize having an extended palette. Yes, for a Rembrandt study, you don't need that many colors. This is true. I know someone's probably going to write in the comments, it's a Rembrandt. Why do you have 20-something colors out there? And this is my everyday palette. This is my everyday highly functional palette. This has modern contemporary colors like cadmium scarlet and dioxazine purple. But it also has classical colors like yellow ochre, lead tin yellow, uh, transparent mummy, which is iron oxide red, uh, it has very classical colors and modern colors at the same time. So with this palette, I can paint anything I want. And again, we have spent a long time to mix up a earthy brown mid-tone. Again, you could have had this color with a limited palette. I'm not saying that you need to use all those colors but I'm advising you to use the modern chemistry and learn how to use an extended palette so that 
Yes, if you can do everything you want with a 5 color palette, imagine what you can do with a 20 color palette. The, the possibilities are endless. And so again, we adjusted an edge for the side of the eye socket there. And as you see, the small shapes are now starting to develop. Centered around the eyes, we start to lock everything in place. The accuracy now jumps from potentially 85% um, to maybe 95% now. Never quite 100 though. A little bit of cerulean blue now. Did Rembrandt have cerulean blue? Likely not. Um, actually, definitely not. He didn't have cerulean blue. What am I doing? I'm using bright colors and neutralizing them with other colors to get certain visual effects. And when I'm mixing, I will admit to you, I hardly think about the colors that I'm using when I'm mixing them. In fact, I'm just looking at a particular shape that I want to paint and I just let my intuition mix or guide the mixtures, guide the paint, the paints that I use for the mixtures. Now we're adjusting the side plane of the nose, merging it towards the maxilla region of the face. And I mentioned something earlier that I really want to clarify, because if you can mix paint as intuitively as you can doing color studies, like still life color studies, I, I have, um, you know, fundamental topics like that in my online classes, um, not so much on YouTube because they tend not to be very popular on YouTube and they take a long time to explain. Uh, if you do color study exercises and you do them enough, you will be able to mix quickly, intuitively, and almost effortlessly. Skin tones shouldn't be a huge uh, mystery. They don't really differ from anything. They don't differ from still life. They don't differ from landscape. They don't differ from anything. You're just mixing paint. The only difference is you're just mixing different paints. That's all it is. You're mixing different paints for portraits than you are for still life, and you're mixing different paints for still life than you are for landscape, unless they are somehow in the same color family. Back to the cerulean blue for a nice neutral brown, neutral grayish brown. And again, leaning towards the terra vert. And now we're using that to put in the side of the face, going right into the shadow tone, pushing it closer to the cooler temperatures to contrast with the skin tones. And again, the texture of the linen that we're using is superb. Again, Klassen's quadruple oil primed, very fine textured linen. You can see it, hopefully you can see the detail of the linen, very little detail of the linen in fact, because it's got very little texture. Excellent, excellent. Um, again, I highly recommend this this linen to use it is absolutely superb and if you do or if anyone does purchase this painting in the future which if you saw um, earlier in the video I did mention that I have eight paintings available for sale this is one of them it will be signed with my name and then after uh, Rembrandt of course I will write that in the um, in the signature process but if you do happen to purchase it then you will really see the texture um, and how fantastic this linen really is. It is quite a, quite pleasant to develop a painting on this 
on this surface. And as you see, nothing too wild and crazy here, just a greenish neutral brown. And we're using it to put more definition for the side of the eye socket. Now, a word on impasto, as you're starting to see me mix a dark value, which is ivory black, raw umber. I, I believe that was a little bit of a viridian that went into it. And now we're going to start to paint in the background. As we paint in the background, we're going to talk about impasto, because Rembrandt and impasto kind of go hand in hand. And if you don't know what impasto is, impasto just means uh, painting with very thick paint. As you see, we're mixing with the palette knife. That is a little bit of black and red uh, on the corner of the palette there from a free previous painting session. I'm mixing it with ivory black and viridian to create a nice uh, dark tone that's not too dark. Now with impasto and Rembrandt, I must tell you, I am not a time traveler. I cannot know exactly how Rembrandt painted his impasto. So I can only speculate as how Rembrandt could have obtained the heavy texture of his paintings. One of my suppositions to that is the lead white that he used through the classical Dutch process. The lead white that Rembrandt used was likely thicker in nature than the lead whites that we have available today, in my opinion, which could have led to that <laughs> no pun intended, which could have led, the lead white, the stack lead white could have led to that um, thickness that you see in the original Rembrandts. Also, the fact that he would have used natural hair brushes, like hog bristle brushes or just bristle brushes, natural hair hairs would, of course, help with that. I also speculate that he didn't use a ton of linseed oil or walnut oil in his initial layers because that would have thinned out the paint a lot so i think he would have reserved that for fine glazes and things to that extent so i believe and i speculate i only speculate that rembrandt's materials and paint handling in terms of using very little medium and using very thick paint and very thick paint applications of course led to that kind of impasto now today, if you want to get this kind of impasto, you have options such as using flake white because we still have it available today and very thick paint and no medium, which coincidentally is what we're doing in this video. As you see, no medium has been used at all, none. Um, and the paint is as thick as it can possibly be and we're using bristle brushes. So you can get a very impasto type look with modern day materials. However, I would warn against using any materials such as uh, too many, I want to say, uh, exotic materials such as like an impasto medium or uh, anything with too much linseed oil or alkyd or anything like that because if you use too much medium, it can lead to some side effects or some adverse effects in your paint film. So just try to keep it as lean as possible, as as naturalistic as possible to get the, um, you know, pure impasto. Speaking of impasto, we're mixing the flake white with the raw umber to get a kind of cool, neutral, valued white that we're going to use for the collar of the uh, of the sitter in this painting. I'm actually starting off with a neutral value and I'm going to go over this neutral value with a, uh, a lighter value but I'm starting with the neutral first. And here's another way you can get impasto. Use a palette knife. It, it, I guarantee you it carries more paint than a brush, any brush. 
you can use a palette knife to layer in more paint than you would get with a brush. And then what you can do is if you don't like the texture of a palette knife, you can use a brush to smoothen out the texture of the palette knife. And as you see, the uh, collar is a little bit more smooth, and now you're seeing how I did that with a synthetic brush. I'm using the synthetic brush just to push the paint around. And now, just flake white on its own. Remember, flake white has the property of which you can use more of it without raising the value too much, enabling you to have a heavier and thicker mixture of paint, which is what we're going to do. And look at that. A ton of it, but it doesn't raise the value that much, which is excellent. If I were to have done that with, say, titanium white, or even flake white replacement, it would have raised the value perhaps a little bit too much. So you would have to adjust it relative to your own particular uh, liking. But you absolutely do not have to use flake white if you choose not to or if you can't. It is not necessary these days, and you can definitely get by without using it just fine. But if you can use it, it is a pleasure to use, as long as you're careful with it. Wear gloves whenever you're handling the paint tubes or the um, any cleanup you do with the palette, or any of the obvious contact that you can possibly have with the paint, just wear gloves. And when you're mixing, keep your hands far away from the, um, from the paint and you'll be just fine. Don't eat, don't drink. If you have paint on your hands, simple stuff like that will keep you safe. And of course, when you clean your brushes, even if you don't use lead white, wear gloves. And now we're just filling in the background tone as we're narrowing down the final minutes in this week's portrait painting video. A little bit of yellow ochre and raw umber for a nice neutral greenish tone is what we're choosing to put in. And this is going to be for the background again. A little bit of lead tin yellow. And we're putting in a gradient of value for the background. You can see it in the original Rembrandt. He uses a gradient for the background for a, uh, a light effect. And we're going in with a modern cadmium orange in the mixture as well. We're going to contrast it with lead tin yellow. And another modern color, cadmium green pale, which will neutralize the cadmium orange and make a very nice uh, air quality to the background. You'll see what I mean. And there it is. You're going to see very quickly now the gradient of the background really helps to create a sense of atmosphere in the background. Now we're going to zoom you in and I'm going to remind you if you want to see this photo reference please go to Google Arts and Culture and read a little bit about the painting. You will see that they mentioned Rembrandt used the back of a brush which is what we used in this last clip here. The back of a brush. Of course, wear gloves because you're going to be very close to the paint. Back of the brush, and I'm actually using it to draw out some of the details for the hair. That being said, I really hope that this week's video helped you out. And if you find that these videos help you out, please check out patreon.com slash artist where you can take your learning further with me and join the online class with over 50 plus lessons with new lessons added weekly starting at $10 a month. You can also upgrade to live streams 
and you can also upgrade to Zoom if you want to paint with me camera to camera, also offered in my online classes. Links to my online classes will be in the description box down below. Also, please don't forget that I have paintings available for sale now, and I'm offering these paintings through my Etsy site. A link to this will be in the description box down below. The paintings are available first come, first serve. You are seeing all eight are available at the time that this video is being published. Take care, and I'll see you on the next one.